and I'm excited about our time together this morning. I had a chance yesterday to visit with our special uh, guest speaker, Rudy Carrasco, on the way here from the airport as well as uh, over dinner last night. And the more I hear this gentleman talk, the more excited I am for those of us who today are going to get a catch a vision for this subject, Enterprising Solutions to Poverty. Business as a means of, of not just poverty alleviation, but eradication. And that fits right in with what our True Charity Initiative is all about. You know, you're going to hear a little bit today from James Whitford, the founder of this initiative and uh, the executive director at Watered Gardens Gospel Rescue Mission. Uh, but just real briefly, I'll tell you, the initiative was launched in the fall of 2012. And our mission is that we are calling communities to effective charity and freedom from welfare started here in Joplin and I can tell you that this this call is being heard far beyond this city. Uh, it's exciting to know that in a few days there's a true charity event in Tulsa that in a couple weeks James will be over in Pittsburgh, Kansas. We've had folks from Springfield, Wichita, Southwest Kansas, the Dodge City area all hearing about what we're doing here in Joplin and wanting to know more and wanting to see how they can implement some of the same things that we're doing here. Well, part of what we do is educate. So we have a time where uh, events in the fall and in the spring where we bring special guests in who have innovative ideas, exciting uh, concepts and principles and tools that we hope we can somehow figure a way to weave those in with what we're doing so that we can be more effective. That's part of what we're about is effective compassion. And so I think you're going to be blessed by what you hear this morning. Why don't we open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll hand it over to James Whitford uh, to uh, get us started. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, just for your kingdom and the privilege it is for us to be a part of it in uh, different capacities, Lord. Uh, you have called us to a mission of love, uh, to love you and to love our neighbor, and we want to do that well. And Father, I just am uh, excited to hear of ways in which some, some concepts that maybe have uh, negative connotations in our modern day. Some people think of business and they think of uh, the corruption of business with uh, how greed can, can come into play. And, uh, Father, but their business is an opportunity for our creative capacities to flourish and to bring honor and glory to you. And so I pray, Father, that we'll get a new uh, vision for the ways in which uh, poverty can be eradicated through business opportunities at different levels and that I know that uh, Rudy is going to uh, share with us today. Father, I also thank you for James Whitford and his uh, vision for this initiative, his leadership. And Father, as he uh, begins to share with us this morning, I pray that we would all just be able to hear clearly what he is intending to communicate, that what he says is what we understand, and uh, that this will spur us all on to greater action and uh, greater thought and and greater cooperative effort here in Joplin and in the surrounding communities. And Father, we pray that this initiative would spread. This is our uh, prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would, let's welcome James Whitford. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Travis was... Travis was talking about a rippling effect earlier. And I've noticed as <clears throat> over the years and being in ministry and being in community, there really is a ripple effect. We are inextricably woven together in a single social fabric. And all of our actions have some sort of an effect on one another, whether they're actions that are charitable or non-charitable, virtuous or non-virtuous, uh, productive or unproductive, whatever the actions are, there's a ripple effect that happens and it's uh, almost as if we're tossing stones uh, into a, like a glassy lake and those ripples are interacting like that. I can tell you I know some folks at the rescue mission that make some ripples <laughs> for sure. and. Uh, I was thinking of one who uh, for 10 years made ripples that weren't very good in our community. He was a junkie. He was homeless on the streets and um, we loved him and uh, we encouraged him and we ministered to him and we challenged him 
and uh, we entered into relationship with him. He came through our doors one day desperate after about 10 years of this running, you might say, and, uh, and he said, I, I need change. And so we took him down to the treatment center. A few weeks later, I picked uh, John up and he came and he lived with me and my wife and our five kids for six weeks. And every morning we got up and we did a Bible study and we exercised and we went to work. And it's amazing what just getting up in the morning and doing a Bible study and exercising and going to work can do for a person. Because, you know, a year and a half later now, he's still employed. He's self-sufficient. He's got an apartment. His whole life has been transformed. And in fact, next week he'll be on the radio speaking to thousands of listeners about how he rose out of poverty and dependence on welfare to self-sufficiency and productivity. So he's still making ripples, isn't he? Amen. He's still affecting other people and now he'll affect many more people. But the ripple effect wasn't always a positive one. It was a negative one. But we entered into relationship and loved John anyway. Now to a great extent, I think that many people in our country today are uh, trying to shield themselves from some of those negative ripples. And in that attempt to isolate, we are creating a divide that widens even more so causing there to be a greater divide between the haves and the have-nots. And in fact, uh, the divide is not merely an economic one, but related and more important, it's relational. And I think that at the extreme ends of this divide, what we see being formed in our nation today are paupers and tyrants. Mm -hmm. Solidarity. It's an interesting word. Collins Dictionary of Sociology defines it as the degree of integration between two people groups or the level of integration among people. The root of integration is integer, a word that indicates a whole or a single. And consider that in any single whole life there are millions of processes at work. A healthy person uh, is one whole in which every cell is producing and consuming. There is exchange happening among, with that cell among all the other cells in the body. So exchange is absolutely necessary for a healthy body and exchange is absolutely necessary for a healthy community. Exchange is key and I believe it's the true mark of solidarity. Now we often think of solidarity with the poor as the act of living among the poor. But I think that simply living among the poor does not necessitate that we're in healthy exchange with the poor. I think we can live among the poor and not be in right relationship with the poor, not be in healthy exchange with the poor. I think that could actually be a type of gentrification. So I had a moment one time of profound exchange about five years ago I found myself in a situation where I was on the streets. I uh, did not have any money. I did not have any food and I was hungry. And there was a guy named Ralph who was homeless that I was with that day. Ralph had a brown bag with a sandwich in it and uh, it had been cut in two. I remember it was a white bread sandwich and it was triangular cut and Ralph said, would you like half of my sandwich, James? And I thought immediately, oh no, I would never take that sandwich from you. So, and I think subconsciously, I might tack on, you poor, homeless, hungry, helpless man. I would never take that sandwich from you, right? Mm. So it's, it's not a thought that was prominent in the forefront of my mind, but I think there was some aspect of pride that was trying to rise up there. But I was hungry that day. And I took Ralph up on his offer and I ate the half a sandwich that he offered me. And it's amazing how a pious facade will crumble mm. when a homeless man 
feed you when you're hungry. And it was kind of a life changer for me. Now, I thought that's a pretty good exchange, but really, it really was an exchange, was it? It was a unilateral transaction. It was Ralph giving something to me. Now, we know, I think we've learned, if you've been with us for any length of time, that repetitive unilateral transactions are not good. How many of you have read Toxic Charity? Okay, so a handful of us in here have read Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. And he goes over five steps to dependency. Um, and here they are, I'll give them to you. You give once, it creates appreciation. If you, if you don't know these, you'll want to write them down because everybody wants to write them down after they hear them. Uh, if you give once, you'll create appreciation in a person. You give twice, anticipation. Three times, expectation. Four times, entitlement. And five times, you'll create dependency in a person. Mm -hmm. It's the five steps to dependency. Now, so we've learned that uh, about that detriment to the recipient of such repetitive charity, but if I'm correct in my assumption that in this social fabric there is truly a reaction to every action, then the recipient's not the only one who plummets in the repetitive, ineffective, charitable transaction, but the giver will as well, right? This is where we started. Every stone, every action tossed into the pond has a ripple effect that's affecting others. For us to think that if we give five times to somebody right in a row that it creates dependency in them and that we're not, <laughs> and that we're not affected, I think that's wrong. I think we are. And so I think it goes something like this. I give, let's say you, you give something to somebody once, they feel appreciation, you feel exhilaration. You give something to somebody twice, they feel anticipation, like we discussed, and you feel purpose. You do it a third time, they feel expectation, you feel necessary. You give it a fourth time, they feel entitlement, you feel essential. And a fifth time you give something to somebody, they are dependent and you feel indispensable provider. It's like the five steps to dependency has a counterpart for those of us that are involved in what I would consider sloppy charity, where it's five steps to paternalism. And I think that's exactly what happens. Healthy exchange with the poor safeguards us from this kind of community division and sickness. In light of exchange, I want to highlight the importance of work in poverty relief efforts because that's our focus today. In the last year at the mission of the 18,000 needs that were met through our, through our ministry, about 55% of those were earned by folks that you and I would consider poor. They earn basic items such as food, clothing, and shelter in our worth shop. The work includes crafting handmade journals, weaving paracord bracelets, making jewelry. Thanks for buying some of that stuff, Rudy. He, he, he bought some yesterday. There we go, right. So uh, running a lawn care business or helping with our coffee business, the redeemed bean. <laughs> and uh, over the last few years that we've had this project underway, I've heard single moms say, thank you for letting me earn my own Christmas gift for my child. I've heard a homeless man gratefully say, it's like we get to keep our dignity. And another one who said, working for my bed and meals takes the shame out of the game. I remember one person in our shelter usher me up to his locker just so he could show me the gift that he had earned for his son's birthday. And inspired by the dream of self-reliance, I've watched the poor turn in their food stamp and TANF benefit cards. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had a young man do this. He made a virtuous decision for work over welfare. Alexis de Tocqueville, which some of you are familiar with, said there are two reasons why a person works. One is simply to survive. The other is to improve the condition of his life. But I would argue that there's a third, that there can be truly a virtuous motive that causes someone to want to go to work so that they are not dependent on another. Regardless of the reason why, it's arguable that as long as work is not unethical, 
it's beneficial. It challenges the body, the mind, or both. And challenge is the force for development. So I read some recent research uh, that was published in the American Psych Journal of Psychology, I think is the journal. They studied 6,000 people who were unemployed for uh, about four years. And they all had decline in personality traits that they were measuring. Openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness uh, had all declined in these folks, even though their basic needs were still being met. Maybe we should think of work or employment as not just a positive outcome from our poverty relief effort, but rather a necessary input that would drive more positive outcomes. Work on the front end rather than just trying to figure out how to get people employed. Uh, you might also know that a Michigan Income Dynamics study, we've talked about it before, in 2001 revealed that the welfare poor were statistically more likely to say they were inconsolably sad than the working poor, even though they had the same amount of disposable income. Work has value, but it doesn't create it. We've got to be careful that when we begin a discussion dealing with the poor working their way out of poverty, a discussion based on poverty resolution through entrepreneurialism or labor, that we don't confuse the value of work with the value of the person. We're here today because we're interested in the value of the person. And it's not work that creates value, but the recognition of inherent value that inspires one to work. At our Missions Worth Shop, we don't require work so that we can esteem a person valuable we esteem the person valuable and wonder why wouldn't they work? I would say that personal value is less the function of production and more that of potential. So consider for a minute uh, property, land. My dad owns some acreage where he does some cattle farming. He bought that years and years ago. I think it was $750 an acre. I think he could get about $1,500 an acre for it right now. Maybe more. Okay, maybe more. Uh, if we were to take one acre of my dad's land at maybe $2,000 an acre, if we could somehow uproot it and lift it and move it and then put it down, say at 7th Street and Range Line Road in Joplin, <laughs> Now how much is the value of that property? Why is it so much more? Because of its potential, right? So in conclusion, uh, as I begin to introduce Rudy, let me encourage you to do this with me. Imagine a community in which the poor are realizing their potential one in which those that have merely subsisted in a state of poverty sustained by welfare and ineffective charity are awakened to their inherent value, awakened to dream of more than just self-sufficiency, but even to enterprise and maybe to enterprise solutions that would help us all. So welcome to Enterprising Solutions to Poverty. Now let me introduce Rudy. I have some stuff here I'll read to you about him, but I want to share with you that when I, f the first thing, the first time I remember thinking, I, I really like this guy and I want to be his friend, is when I heard him on a, it was either in person or on a video. I, I know he says it on a video, but I think he said it in person at a class one time too that I was attending in Grand Rapids. And he said, uh, you know, he was raised in East LA. Uh, he was in poverty and, uh, and growing up as a kid, he, uh, he realized all of a sudden that God has a heart for cities. And when he said that, it just resonated with me, you know, because we're talking about God touching our communities, helping us change for the better our communities and our cities. And uh, so that was so exciting to hear from Rudy.
He's the former executive director of the Harambee Christian Family Center in Pasadena, California, an associate director at Partners Worldwide, a regular lecturer for the Acton Institute, and a member of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund's Alumni Hall of Fame. He serves on the advisory board of the Christian Community Development Association as well. He's a graduate of Stanford uh, with a BA in English. Uh, Rudy's essays have appeared in such places as the LA Times, Christianity Today, and Religion News Service, and various other journals. In 2001, he was among a small group of Hispanic religious leaders from around the country who advised President George W. Bush on faith-based initiative, initiatives. And in 2002, he was inducted into the Hispanic Scholarship Fund's Alumni Hall of Fame. Would you, yeah, wouldn't you, well, right? Well, you'd expect that after that, right? Would you welcome Rudy, please? Thank you. Great, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for providing that very authentic hailstorm at about 7.45. <laughs> I said, okay, for, I was in the hotel. For, there's some teenagers here, no? There's an early morning event, no? The window's about to break. It's like, what is it? I was, oh, I'm in Joplin, Missouri. <laughs> so, appreciate that. So the structure of the time uh, this morning, you saw the schedule, we have two blocks. In the first block, I'm gonna do a little bit of formality with the presentation, just to get, it, it gives a nice overview, not simply of partners worldwide, but also this approach that's developed because people like you, working in partnership for nearly 20 years now, committed to continuous improvement and learning, we've arrived at something that, um, a helpful set of tools for working in partnership to use business as a tool to end poverty. So uh, some overview of that, and then some very practical examples of what some people are doing in the United States. And then we've got this great whiteboard to um, either sort of noodle out and, and, and uh, uplift some of the ideas you may have about enterprising solutions to poverty. Others, we're gonna kill them today <laughs> as an act of mercy. And we'll use some entrepreneur speak and call it a pivot. You know that in the whole entrepreneur startup world, you pivoted. You wanted to give 10 cent cups of coffee, and that's not sustainable. So you pivoted and changed your whole model. So um, that's act you can actually help people by, uh, in a loving, affirming way, helping them to think through their idea that's not going to work. So they can use the time and energy and resources on things that will be more effective. So that's the structure. Cool? Cool. cool? cool. All right. Great. So partners worldwide, we aspire to end poverty so that all may have life and have it abundantly. So almost half the world, more than three billion people, live on less than 250 a day. So you hear different statistics. Who lives on less than a dollar a day? And that Congressman, you see so many numbers, you know, you're, I mean, you're like, how do you, how do you make sense of all of it? But some of the best data out there now is using the measure of 250 a day and where are people at? And this is just one of the indicators of where people are at globally. A lot of organizations want to help out. But as James was unpacking earlier, uh, most interventions are not really dealing with deeper issues and they actually perpetuate dependency and they lack respect for the innate capability of people. Um, a very shorthand story, um, there are a fair number of orphanages in Haiti where the children in the orphanage have both parents who are right down the road. And, and really, if you were to look at it again, what you're actually looking at is more of a boarding school. Uh, but it's called an orphanage, and frankly, in our literature, in our fundraising and marketing, we talk about it as if these children are actually orphans. When in fact, what happened is, because of the conditions, the parents, as any parent, have seen an opportunity for their child <coughs> to be in that place and get schooling and support and all this stuff versus what the parent cannot provide. And so often you'll see a parent will 
parents will send their kids. And so you're saying, wow. I don't think anyone intended to start that way. People just wanted to help out. Talk about an unintended consequence. That's just one thing that always pops to mind when I think about um, wanting to help and just going in some other direction. Um, and the, you know, James is, was saying, this is a really big one. I, I find I'm challenged all the time. Um, when people present at Water Gardens Rescue Mission, we met a number of people and a lot of great stories, people taking steps forward in their lives. A lot of the men are broken, messed up, and a combination of the two. And so it can be kind of hard to look at that, one of those guys, and say, you know, I think you could do this, but I'm not sure you could do this. You know, and, and, and as us being human, we look at it and we're kind of being rational, right? Except we're also the people who believe that a man rose from the dead. Mm-hmm. We're also the people who believe that that creator created this amazing natural world as complex it, as it is with his word. And that same word created us. Our physical matter, our soul, our minds, our capacity. So it turns out we have no idea what Charlie's capable of. We have no idea what that other guy who had relapsed and was stumbling in the hallway. Because it's not about that person or about our understanding. It's about the creator created them, the same creator. So here we are between believing in God's creation and dealing with the people in front of us, right? And we need faith to step forward. And oftentimes we fail. Usually there's a deadline we have. We have to make some program decisions, some tough calls. We're being prudent on the management side, but what we're doing is we're undermining the true health and what's truly good for other people. So um, it's a challenge globally. Partners Worldwide would take a different approach. We mobilize long-term, hands-on global relationships to form a powerful Christian network that uses business as the way to create flourishing economic environments in all parts of the world. We affirm business as something good, a gift that God has given us without qualification. Now, it is a powerful force in the world, unbelievably powerful. And so the critique of business is a good critique because Misused, it causes great misery. However, we cannot single out business alone. There are many powerful forces in the world that need to be put under God's plan, his vision for the world, morality and virtue. Religion, food, sex are just three forces in the world that I think of that are very powerful very influential, and when stewarded properly, when religion is stewarded properly, it unlocks so much of what God has put into us. When religion is misused, oh, Lord have mercy. The entire non-Christian world tells us about all the things we as Christians have done when we've misused religion. Food. No one's going around thinking about food, but you know what? We know about the misuse of food. We know about the misuse of food and people's individual eating habits. We know globally what happens when, you know, all the food that's, the rice that was dumped in Haiti before the earthquake and after in a well-intentioned purpose to help Haitian people that drove Haitian farmers out of business. Food. So food is this powerful element that needs to be stewarded and can be misused. Sex, God created sex. It is good, period. And we know what devastating brokenness comes when sex is misused. Greed. Greed can be applied in all of the spheres that I mentioned. I think it's actually, I'm going to go on and say that it's jealousy is one of the roots that drives us to really focus on business more than all these other areas of brokenness. But in my book, I'm looking and saying, you know what? Everything has to be challenged. Clergy have to be challenged about our greed. Mm -hmm. 
institutions, others. Everybody needs these challenges. We don't single out business. And in fact, we need to affirm business. Um, I'll use shorthand about the goose that lays the golden egg. It's not that simple, but be business, productivity, creating, providing, sustainability, those are things that we all need. And we need more of them. We need it to be done well. In our environment, we put down. We don't affirm business enough. So we bring, as Partners Worldwide, an unqualified <coughs> affirmation that business is a tool to be used for God's glory and that we need business people to be who you are and be who you are in partnership with others who are, want to work together to have an impact. God did not make a mistake when he wired you for business. Our model is partnership. And so it's a unique three-way partnership. And this came out of our, exhibition, our experience in missions. Um, it wasn't called When Helping Hurts Then, but we're definitely trying to solve issues. So the three-way partnership, and, and, and I have some annual reports here. I was going to give them out, but I thought, oh, you're going to be flipping through it while I'm talking. So I said, I'm not going to do that. John Perkins would be like, Rudy, why'd you do that? They weren't listening. They were looking at the brochure. So I'll share that with you later. In the brochure down here, this leads out to a map of the globe. We have organizations operating in 25 countries. So these partnerships, <coughs> the partnerships start with a local community institution. And then a business affiliate is, so this is an organization somewhere on the ground. For our, I'm not trying to talk you into nothing or put you on the spot, but let me just use Watered Gardens. Watered Gardens is a local organization committed here in Joplin, has legs under it, and is focused on poverty alleviation, aligns with our values in terms of Christ and the person. And they're big actually thinking about how can enterprise be a part of the solution for the men and women coming through. So they're a local group. We've found that it is important, we learned the hard way. It is important in your ministry to have a local partner that is as committed or more committed than you are. So if for a moment, if you're a part of a church and your church does global missions at all, put that hat on for a moment, okay? Your church is gonna fly to Ghana and do something, put that hat on. Your partner in Ghana, you need a strong local partner that is more committed than you are to that project you're working on. Because if you don't have a local partner, one, they have the local knowledge, they know their community, they know people, they know what it takes to get things going. You don't know the culture. And while you may have a great week together, if you really want to bring transformation in any area, it's going to take years. And you need local people who, again, have the knowledge, but have a commitment that goes beyond yours. And that means when you and your dollars get back on the plane, they're already going to do this stuff versus they only do it when your dollars are around. We've seen a lot of that. And what happens? There's no forward progress. There's, no, there's, an, there's five weeks of great activity, amen. But the long-term change has no chance at all because you did not have a local partner. So in our structure, the, the, we look at the local partner and they say, what, is, what do you see as your goals for alleviating poverty? We have a local partner in Chicago called Sunshine in Southside Chicago, 61st Street. They have their own passion. They want to help create 200 jobs in a community with 20% unemployment. Woodlawn, which is Saul Alinsky's neighborhood. I always love to tell that one. Right there in Saul Alinsky's neighborhood, they're growing a private enterprise ministry. They, uh, so they have a very specific vision. They want to help create 200 jobs right there in that neighborhood with high unemployment to not only employ 200 people, but to begin a virtuous cycle that encourages people who are local to say, wait a minute, I can run my own business. So that's what they want to do. The business affiliate, so Partners Worldwide, we're this global network, and we're a support network, and we bring a number of interesting tools, including a lot of the knowledge I'm sharing with you. 
This is a group of business people who are interested in helping out. So they would be on the church side having flown to Ghana, and what can we do to help out? And they're business people. And we're saying, be yourself as a business person. You help them on their goal of 200 jobs. Well, what's that going to take? Well, let's start by listening to them, but you're, you're basically going to employ business tools, strategic planning, budgeting, building out networks of people who get behind the mission, assessing your products and slash programs. Are these things going to work or not? And bring your business mind. You know, a lot of our meetings end up being five to seven minutes. Because, you know, you, when you've been in business for a while in your particular area of expertise, you can chop it up pretty quickly really quickly, right? So bring who you are. And so we'll say to this, but it's very important because this group tends to be from outside the community. There's things they just don't know and understand. They will grow in their knowledge in partnership, but there's always, there's so important for this group to have a posture of walking alongside that group. They're not here to do what they think. You know, right now we've got a guy who has a really beautiful model of a tech computer thrift store. So it's a thrift store, except it's all donated computer items, and, um, and, they, and they resell it. They're printing money. Uh, he showed me the model, and I said, I'm in the wrong line. I mean, it's a thrift store. You know, Grand Rapids is full of thrift stores. It's Compra New. And he showed, and he said, let me tell you the opportunity. There are two Compra New stores in Grand Rapids area. They're doing a million a year. It's all donated tech stuff, right? So staff and volunteers to, and he said, they have a warehouse with enough donated stuff to supply seven other locations. They only have two. Your guys in Chicago could use some of that abandoned space across the street and open a computer recycling store and they could be making money to take care of the mission. So it makes sense. That's his idea. That's not their idea. And he's actually, frankly, he's a bit frustrated. He's like, why won't they do it? It makes all the sense in the world. They have a logic model that they're following and they have all these ideas that are suggested to them but they don't fit how they want to work with the people in the community. So they haven't said no, but they, they, they haven't moved forward on that. And so th there's sort of a who has the decision rights in this? The best people, it's subsidiarity. The best people to make the judgment are the people closest to the problem. It is not them. It is not here. It's them. But they are not making decisions alone. That's why it's a partnership. We're given all the advice in the world. We're like, look, guys, 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 guys. But at the end of the day, they need to make that decision. And they all live there in the community and everything. So in our partnership model, it's working together, definitely identifying um, the local group and then the people who want to work on the goals of the local group. So one example of an LCI, we have 70, we have 80 now, but in our annual report it says 71. <coughs> we have 71 of these local community institutions that are embedded in a community um, around the world. <coughs> We have a number in Kenya, Uganda, East Africa. In Uganda, so if you've heard of the whole child soldiers issue in northern Uganda, the Civil War, really terrible. Gulu really went through rough stuff. So Gulu, in Gulu, um, Timothy Jokena, he's not pictured here, he had started making, lo he was a, a local guy from Uganda. Talented guy, he actually had five gas stations for a while and did some other stuff. He just began making very small loans to people that he knew. Because you're in community, you know people, people need help. What are you going to do? So, you know, he was managing the loans out of two pockets. Our team met him. And over about a 10-year period, we've been working with him. A business affiliate group has been working with him. Visits once to twi two times a year to Uganda and helping him to develop his loan fund. Last year, our, we have a global fund where we make loans to the LCIs. Um, very modest um, terms, but it, it's a loan with interest for sustainability of our fund. 
and they turn around and reloan to theirs. We loaned them 400,000 US, and they're turning around, and so these are some of the team members of their loan institution. So that's one example. Not all of our local groups do loans, but a number of them do. Uh, so it's a locally owned, led, independent org, so it's registered with the c in country, it's got a board of directors, because that's a best practice. We're encouraging, you know, you want to help, things are broken, okay, let's begin moving forward to what we know is sustainable. Best practices. They're working to end poverty by catalyzing entrepreneurs and job creators in their communities. So the business <laughs> affiliate, so this is a scene in coffee, I think that's, I'm not sure what the, in Nicaragua. So experienced business people deeply commit to assist a local community institution. These individuals and groups help develop concrete plans, share expertise, and provide financial support. We've, uh, in Nicaragua and Honduras, we've had some long-standing partnerships. Um, and including, um, I think the, the coffee partnership in Nicaragua has been going about 10 years with these Iowa farmers. And uh, I get the detail right. I think the last step this past year was to help the farmers gain ownership of their land. Because they had been, they had an arrangement, but they didn't have ownership, and that can be its own, you know, morass, you know, legally as well as getting the capital. But they made, I think, the arrangement was that the Iowa, they made their partnership agreement signed. The Iowa farmers made purchases, and then the farmers have been purchasing, paying off the land, but getting a hold of title to their own land. So that talk about a systemic intervention. So it's one thing to help them be a better farmer and increase profits. Another thing to help them get ownership, right? And it takes a while. It takes a while. So, um, but it's, it's a beautiful story. So partners worldwide, our staff, so this is my, I'm a regional facilitator for North America, for the US. This is mostly the US, but I'm technically Canada too. And we actually have a group in Canada, a, uh, a woman from, I think either Nigeria or Ethiopia settled in a Toronto suburb, and she's been doing support for women entrepreneurs who are primarily refugees. And she has interest in joining our network. So they haven't formally joined, but I'm like, and Toronto's not that far from Grand Rapids, and it's, Grand Rapids is cold already. I mean, if I was in California, I'd be like, Toronto, no. But, so, uh, but Bob is my peer. He's the Latin America regional facilitator. He lives in Managua, uh, but he is over Ecuador, we have, a, we have partnerships in Ecuador, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Um, so we're at the heart of partners. We identify new LCIs. We orient the business affiliates. We facilitate existing partnerships. Um, and we use annual planning tools. We have an online hub. It's a Microsoft SharePoint site for recording metrics, uh, managing financials, and keeping our global body of knowledge. Uh, so we work on, here's the, the bigger graphic I was showing you. I just like the graphic. It was, you know, sometimes you do a rebrand and something and it's not so good. This, this, is, this has helped me do my job. Let me put it, I told the team, I said, thank you. So we have groups all around different parts of the world. Um, Southeast Asia is a region. India is its own region. Africa has three regions, uh, West, East, and South, Latin America. Haiti and the Caribbean is its own region. And then the United States, uh, North America. So that's what we do. We create partnerships with local community institutions, removing obstacles, building up permanent local capacity designed to <coughs> catalyze entrepreneurs and job creators, and celebrate business as a calling to do God's work. So the strategic activities we encourage all these partnerships to be involved in our training, mentoring, advocacy, and access to capital. So this is a business a professional at a large church in Cuenca, Ecuador. The church itself has been hosting business training classes using our curriculum, which is translated into seven languages now, so in Spanish. And they're getting a lot of non-Christians who will come. And it's been a very nice thing, because the business training is solid business training that our team globally worked on in iterations over a number of years. Uh, and, and of course, it's a great opportunity to share the gospel. And they work it out very well. They, they're very clear, like, you know what? We're not, this is not a bait and switch. We're not gonna like just talk, you know, it's the classes what we did. There's biblical basis for business 
and then business chops and strengthening your business. So training is important. Mentoring is just huge. It's just huge. This is, mentoring is sort of this big word and it means so many things and we want it to mean all. It's relationship. So you'll get a person who is starting or growing a business in the community and yeah, you go through a class, you could read a book, go through a class, watch a YouTube, you got some content. But what a business owner tends to need is ongoing relationship, ongoing knowledge, ongoing connections. Because you're always being faced with new challenges in the competitive market. You're always learning about your own business. You know, and you need to talk to people who either really know precisely what you're doing or can help you on some things more general like HR. Um, and people that you trust and people who actually care. So the mentoring ends up being just a big opportunity for business people to be involved in our network. Advocacy. So this is uh, one of our local partners is Association for More Just Society. <coughs> and they, in Latin America, they worked for years on land reform. Again, more uh, people being able to purchase their property. Uh, in the book, The Mystery of Capital, written by Hernando de Soto, he describes how all around the world, the, the poor actually have a lot of assets and have a lot of things that they could turn into wealth and that they could grow, but because of the lack of property ownership, they're not unable to do anything with their assets. Like they, like they, they, they did this, uh, in the book, they did this survey in Haiti, and they said, let's Let's put a valuation on all, on the assets owned by average everyday, you know, Haitians of all kinds. And let's see how much value is in the country. And they estimated that the value owned by Haitians at the time was 50 times greater than all the foreign aid pouring into the country. Which is to say, you're like, you're telling me that Haiti is rich and there's all this value and money and, and they were saying, well, Yes, but here's the problem. None of that can, is titled like a little house, even if the house is a shanty worth 400 US. Well, if you have title, you can take that to a bank or some finance institution and get a $20 loan. It's all we do, right? But there is no title. There aren't, and, and whether for the house or cars or other things, you don't have the system like we do. So they coined a phrase called it dead capital. So the amount of active capital Haitians have is what we see. The amount of dead capital is huge. So what's it going to take to unlock? What's it going to take for that Haitian to get, to be able to collateralize their house and get a loan? Well, it's going to take reform mm -hmm. of the system, which is just sort of a wah, 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 just a downer of a, because it's so huge, right? Well, DeSoto and his team have been working on this for years, and the team here, these lawyers, I think it's Honduras, have been working on this same issue of title reform, land and property reform. This is one of the women in the network with the title to her property. Imagine how that's going to stimulate business growth. That business owner can now go get a loan against their property. So, um, so that's an opportunity for business. Because that's the type of stuff you have to do in business anyway. You have to deal with challenges like that. Well, be who you are with what you know in a context of poverty that, where you can really unlock opportunity. Access to capital. We raise capital so local community institutions can fund the dreams of individual entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, in Kenya, so... The Global Fund, again, we make loans to the LCIs. And for the most part around the world, those groups that are doing loans, those, they're still pretty small loans by our standards and even over in the countries where they're at. We started something new, um, called it the, the Middle Market Initiative. Pretty small fund, like two and two and a half million. Um, but it started because it, people like this, I don't remember his name, he's in Kenya. So. His business had grown, and what he needed, he needed larger, um, a larger amount of loan than a lot of the microfinance institutions, finance institutions could provide. Uh, at so, you know, the harbor in Kenya, 
So I was saying last night at dinner, I, I get to hear so many interesting things around the world. Um, getting things in and out of the harbor is really terrible in things that we held up, bribes, all this stuff. Haiti, same thing. Well, getting stuff in and out of the harbor, international shipments, he was needing short-term loans of about 30,000 U.S. But a lot of the small loans, most of the small pots, the MFIs, microfinance institutions, could not do a loan with him. And yet the banks, the larger banks that would, their interest rates were still higher than he felt he could handle. So he's part of a, a group that's been with us since the beginning, this partner um, for about 18 years. So it took a little bit of time to think through a process, but we created a fund that that LCI is managing to get people like this guy loans to remove. And so talk about removing an obstacle, right? Removing obstacles. I hate to interrupt, but um, one of the problems that we seem to have in our own community is uh, alternative uh, uh, methods of credit rating um, because you can have someone who pays their rent on a timely basis for a hundred years and it's never reported to the credit agency. You could even have them, uh, God forbid, uh, pay off all of their payday loans on time and it's never reported to FICO. Um, so they, it seems to me that establishing alternative uh, methods of reporting for an alternative agency, do we have anything like that? Is there anything in, in the United States that uh, any way that we can come up with uh, alternative ways for people to to establish a credit line? That's a that tremendous question, I'm, I'm going to parking lot it. I wrote it down. Let's come back to that. Okay. Um, because you're, you really hit the nail on the head. I mean, so, you know, people who are not seen by the existing systems, and yet nevertheless, um, they're not only capable, they have a track record in another sphere that simply isn't seen. It's, it's like a, it's a dead capital in another way. It's their dead social capital, right? So how do we get that, get it, make it visible that this is this person has creditworthy characteristics? Let's come back to that. Thank no, and thanks for the question. You know, if you have any questions or comments, I'll receive them and I'll parking lot them, unless it's like really, really, really awesome. <laughs> no, I said that because now they're all like, "What's it gonna take for me to make a really, really you know, the competitive people, right?" <laughs> I'm just keeping you awake. It's Saturday morning. It was a long week. You know, if you're like me, you're a little tired. You know, just keep it interesting. Though, so global results we measure um, annually. Just some of the measurements. We have 71 local community institutions, 33 business affiliate groups. Last year, uh, 4,700 business training graduates. 11 million in loans were made by our local partners. Uh, 304 prayer partners. So there are a number of books out now, and you know, Gallup. Gallup had a book, um, anyone remembers the title, tell me, it was something like The Coming Jobs War or something like that. Or, and they said the number one thing in huge global surveys, ask anybody anywhere on the planet, what do you look, need, what are you looking for? They want a job, a job. Christian or not, whatever or not, I mean, this is the big throbbing need that people have. And certainly as the church, we know it's a practical need, it's also an opportunity. So we start by measuring jobs, creating sustain. And of this number, it's a little over 10,000 were created, a little over 80,000 sustained. Now, a lot of these, you don't have the next Facebook in here. Let me, be, let me make a statement of modesty here. A lot of these businesses and jobs are very small, a single proprietor all around the world. But they're real jobs, they're their own businesses, and they have visions to grow and be sustainable. And absolutely addressing the poverty in their own lives and in their own communities. Here in the United States, some examples. In South Texas, we have a partner called Center for Peace. <coughs> um, you know, one thing, among the things they do, they're very small, doing some very good work, and, and rescue missions and other groups can kind of see them. They're like, they're in that space. Um, 
the women in the recovery program start out on day one with responsibility. So, I mean, they're, they're, the women are most part court referred. I mean, 60 days in jail or go into this program, what is it? You know, like, oh, I'll go to Center for Peace. So the women show up and they're like, they were just in court, you know, this close to being back in jail. And so, and so they're, and they're small, so, so they can, I mean, I don't know how they would do this if 20 at a time are coming through, you know, but being smaller, they can put that attention. And they get them to, they're doing their classes that they're required to take in terms of personal development, but they're also helping to operate the ministry of, um, <coughs> of <coughs> I'm getting their, so the women, the women, the court-referred women, right, um, in the program, going through the program, took a lot of time in coaching. They develop, they've developed a number of training curricula. And one of them is this power lift. Um, and they really did it themselves. They, they, they got a th certain print. They stapled it. I think they've got it bound differently now. And what this is, an introduction to a curriculum on how to create a platform-based social enterprise for your community. So they actually go around and train groups like yours. Written by Stella Sanchez, who's her, Jessica Moreno and Cheryl Miller. Her story, she was the prostitute. Not a prostitute in the community, she was the prostitute. On and off of drugs, in and out of this program for over a 10 year period. And in her last run of about two, two and a half years, really turned a lot around. And in the meanwhile, God's gifted all of us with talent, and she's always been very good at making salsa. Always. So she went, <coughs> took a business training class. So one of the things that's offered as part of their approach, they say, you, whatever's on your heart, take, take some classes and develop. So she went through the entrepreneurship class. The, the ministry had, had received a, a donation, about 30,000 bucks, put it aside for loans at some point in the future. I mean, they took the money, and they're like, we don't even know when we're going to have a business program. Um, but a leadership resource team is more or less like a business affiliate that I described before. Th this group hasn't signed into our system. They're, they're doing a Texas thing and keeping it all like, <laughs> who are you? You're from Michigan? That's like a million miles away. You know? <laughs> I'm like, Texas, you're independent. We get it. <laughs> Great people. So, but, but it's a, a team of business people. And she went, she went and pitched her business idea. And, we, and, and the message was, hey, don't make it, don't just give her the money, thinking with a sad heart. Keep your brain on, OK? But, but bring, bring a little bit of a deeper you know, effort. So they said, you know, you're not ready, but they gave her a list of suggestions. She went back and worked on it for about six weeks, came back and re-pitched. And they said, you know what? We actually think you could do something. They approved a $2,800 loan. She wanted to do grow her own tomatoes, hydroponic garden. So uh, they approved the loan. And, but you see, they, they brought their business expertise to that. And, but they were patient with her. They coached her along. And you know, I know a few of those guys. I, the value of that, those hours alone, that was a huge investment for them. And so we need that sort of thing because she's doing well. The business is growing. She just got married. She helps with this, among other things. So again, they, had, they wrote the curriculum. As you can see, they did a solid job. They're going to have to figure out some of the formatting. They did their own graphics. Um, the women did it themselves. And so again, when you look at this, you're going to be like, you're going to be like, well, we can get this. I got my designer. He's hungry for an opportunity. Careful. Because yes, the designer, Christian brother or sister is going to do a great job, really help them, opportunity for them to serve. You could totally undermine the women. They're just building their own confidence in doing this. We're being patient. They're going to have to develop their own graphic design thing. Maybe the women reach out to the guy. Let it be the women that reach out to the guy. They have to have the decision rights and the ownership. That's going to build them up inwardly. 
You could totally kneecap them, cut them off at the knees, break their spirit, just because you, you could really help it. What can I do to help? It's so subtle. And I'm pointing fingers at you, but there's four, three pointing right back at me. I'm talking all this stuff. I'm the worst. I'm the worst offender at this stuff because I want to help. I want to be involved. But it's beautiful what's happened there in Texas. In Mississippi, uh, we have a group called Gulf Coast Business <laughs> Partners. So Denny Vandermolen is a business affiliate. And these are two uh, women who own businesses. They don't lead the LCI. They are businesses that were trained in the, the group called Gulf Coast Business Partners. So this group has a vision for create hundreds of jobs along Mississippi's Gulf Coast. Uh, that area was really hit hard by Katrina. I mean, you know about disasters, and, and you also know about when government swoops in. I mean, around here. I don't, I'm not going to start in on a whole government deal, but, um, you know, it's a risk. Um, and so they, they're actually inking a deal this month with the city of Moss Point. I don't know if you've been down that area at all. You know, here's, here's New Orleans. You start in over the Gulf Coast, Gulfport, Biloxi, and you're kind of moving in, and there's this whole little area. Moss Point's over here. So Moss Point is the poorest city in that area. It's got a really a lot of challenges. And Gulf Coast Business Partners is going to do a business training. Get this. So the Win Job Center. So people who are unemployed, are receiving benefits, part of the whole deal of what are you going to do to take some forward steps in your life includes going to the Win Job Center. So the Win Job Center is going to be recruiting for this business class. Now, it's only one source of recruitment. They're doing all sorts of recruitment all over the town. But the local officials are really interested in connecting people who are receiving benefits and looking for opportunities and saying, you know what, not only can you find jobs here at the Wind Job Center, but here's a business class. Maybe you can start your own. So they're just cutting that deal right now. Denny's been advising them on how to structure that. Denny, he's a... He's a business owner of a Vermeer tractor dealer. He has five dealerships um, in Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, I think Shreveport, and Memphis. And there's two, I think, in Arkansas. <coughs> uh, Christian Guy has been involved with our network for a number of years, loves this stuff. So what he's been doing for about a year is that one day a month, he puts aside, he drives from Jackson where he lives, two and a half hour drive to Gulfport, leaves at around six in the morning, and spends the whole day just going and visiting the businesses. And look what he ends up doing. The Blush Boutique is a fashion retail. I think this woman has a, a hair salon. He's a tractor dealer. <laughs> I love it, you know. So, I mean, the first, we have this photo of him when first showing up in the, in, the, in the hair salon. And, you know, he's, in the photos, he's just rubbing his, his you know, his scalp, right? And they're like, well. But, you know, it turns out that management is universal, right? Yeah. Management principles are universal. Yeah. Keeping up with your finances, principles for that, universal stuff. Goal setting, strategically looking at your market, universal. So he's had a great time building relationships, building trust. Um, in Chattanooga, so talk about prisons. Prisons are full of a lot of prodigal sons. Yeah. There's also a lot of talent, a lot of brokenness. So it's not just like Mark Zuckerberg sitting there waiting to let, be let out of the, the prison and to go start the business. You know, people's lives, there's a lot. You're in prison for a reason. But there's a lot of opportunity. So we have a partner launch. They're focused on a high unemployment area, 25% in South Chattanooga. Um, these numbers have all shot up because th this was a prison. I created this slide in October. Um, I would say that's over 200 people. And yeah, they're up to about 90 businesses started. Um, and the cumulative economic, I think, was over 2 million. And these are just a lot of small businesses. So Julius had been in prison for five years, uh, came out, uh, had recommitted his life to Christ, was trying to do everything right, had old, ch old child support payments. He had two and a half jobs still struggling and if you know that story at all I mean yes people need to repay their debts to society but 
we have huge problems with our systems that create additional problems for men and women. So here's a guy living in virtue, trying to do what he can. And so he'd always had a dream of, of some sort of business. And his first thought was a restaurant. And so you find this in urban areas and lower income areas where people are good with food. You know, Stella, right? Salsa. You hear about restaurants all the time. And at the same time, it is tough to sustain a restaurant. But he had an idea of a restaurant. In the training, he had a pivot. Because good training will help you to think through your idea and run some numbers. And, and they and say, said, you know what? A restaurant would be kind of tough, but what about mobile? Mobile food is growing as an opportunity, and you can drive down your cost. And so he made that pivot, did his planning, um, needed to get a truck, and it was amazing. Somebody had a, oh yeah, we don't have the big truck photo, but the leader of the LCI, Hal, was at a, me a meeting in town, and uh, <coughs> somebody had an old sort of county fair type of truck they're trying to get rid of. And, and they were like, hey, you know, pitch that you know, on a trailer, and that could be as mobile for free, right? right. So what happened is it had, a, it had a big old funnel cake side on it, sign on it. And his business is, was called All Dogs and More, Hot Dogs and, and More, not Funnel Cakes. But he has this funnel cake sign, right? So he's out there and he's, business, he's in business and people would come by and they'd see the sign and say, I want funnel cake. And he'd say, we don't have funnel cake. I'm sorry, we, you know, we just got this, but we got hot dogs, we got burgers. What do you, I was like, you don't have funnel cake? Oh, that kept happening. Finally, the person comes up and he says, come back tomorrow and I'll have your funnel cake. The funnel cake is his biggest margin, <laughs> profit margin item. Wow. He cleared over 120000 in his first year. That is his wife. That's his daughter. So in Joplin, um, we're about to head into our break. So I've loaded you with a lot of information. I'm going to load you with these last two slides, and this will lead into some discussion in our second session. So in general, in the US, this is how not only what's, what's, what are opportunities in our communities, this is how people you're thinking are thinking. You're going to talk to people about jobs and the poor and opportunities and they're going to they're going to land, they're going to tend to land in these categories. This is everybody who doesn't have a job, need to get a resume, you know, how to dress, how to interview, how to go out and look for a job, and there's a lot of this. There's a lot of this. The government has a lot of this. Different agencies and different groups and and yet they still need to do it well. You know, so but people say, "Okay, let's just help these and get jobs. And then you'll have people say, well, maybe we could start a business and employ some people. You know? And so Water Gardens has the Worth Shop where they are, you know, we know a business that got, you know, at Starbucks for a while you could buy a bracelet for five bucks and it contributed toward, what was it called? Indivisible, I think. Actually, yeah, they did this about two years ago. You could pay five bucks for a yellow bracelet and most of the proceeds would go to job creation initiatives in the US. This is at a point when the unemployment rates were much higher than they are right now. And so at Starbucks, there was a group in Michigan, three miles down the road, that got the contract to assemble these, the things that were sold at Starbucks. They ended up doing more than a million of them. They had 22 people working. It was amazing. It was, it was contract based, so these were not permanent full-time jobs. That was like the one big caveat. But I mean, I didn't say that yesterday, but I'm like, mm, I'm like, let's call Starbucks or somebody. <laughs> Water Gardens is flooded with, oh, we gotta assemble. All of you are to work. You're all working side by side with the men <laughs> assembling stuff. But people say, start a business to employ people. And so, and what you'll have here is you'll often have a person who is in business already, has been successful in business, you know how to start businesses. So you go out and you know, start a landscape business, Start a snow blowing business in Joplin. I know you don't have snow blowing. Up in Michigan, it's snow blowing is needed. Um, and so that's an opportunity. People don't tend to think about poverty and the final two. You, because again, we're looking at that poor person and, and kind of thinking they probably, if we can get them to do this much, praise God, we don't really see them doing this. And we're being rational, it's going to be tough, but. There is talent there. So 
There are existing people in the community who have businesses that are up and running year after year. They may have obstacles to growth. Think about the woman with getting title in Honduras. We know a guy who, total community hero in Grand Rapids, had been in prison himself, runs a little hamburger shop, overemploying people, trusted, amazing. Yeah, but his business is teetering, his own personal finances. We asked him one day, hey, what do you, what do you need? He's like, if I owned my building, that would change everything. I was like, well, what do you need? I need about 30,000 bucks. And there's a long story with that. And, and he ended up getting a partnership with a great different group that was not working with us. But what happened was, not he was in a land contract with somebody. He was in this deal, paying rent, but supposedly getting ownership. It was weird. A banker at, at the local Christian men's group came through and said, let me look at your papers. So this guy put in a lot of time. And he called a meeting, and he sat him down, and he said, look, <clears throat> The guy you've been paying to does not own the property. No one owns the property because X, 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 and X had happened in the past. It's a Gordian knot. However, with the new laws, we have authority to untie that knot and make a judgment. They got him the property. Wow. It was beyond like a hallelujah praise story. It was crazier than that. He walked in there and said, this is your property. So now, so what he's going to do now is he's going to start doing all these renovations. I was in there. He's like, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And I was like, because the place is still about that big, right? But, but it was amazing. So starting a business. Uh, so that's this guy. But when you see, like if this guy walked in the door, none of us, me included, would think this guy is an owner with a number of employees running a solid operation. You'd be like, can we help you? you know, really? Like, we'd love to help you. But... People can start their own business. People have a dream. Stella was in here. She had a dream. Went through some training, has long-term relationship and support. I had to say this for you. Springfield, an hour away, Schweitzer United Methodist Church, has a big food pantry. They've been supplying 16,000 people. They're 11 years in. They asked a question last year. They were being very efficient, good stewards. They had, they really, they were being honest, they had no idea if anyone was experiencing transformation. They had no idea if any of these people <laughs> were really changing and getting out of their situation. So they're in a long-term continuous improvement process to think about. And their, their iteration, which is at my blog, they're, so now they're tracking people. And when, pe when they see that a person has come in the second time, then that goes into, I think, it's more like the partnership concept that you said. Like, like now you're more in a part where, where there's exchange. Mm -hmm. But part of exchange is they're going to encourage people to join a class. There's a healthy cooking class, a Bible for beginners, intro to money, jobs for life. Jobs for life is up, is up in that employment readiness, but it's a really awesome example of that. So um, this is all seed. I gave you a lot of information. This is all seed. We may start with your question first, just because I know we need to go to the commercial break.